Welcome to the Emergency Medicine Cases Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Anton Hellman, bringing you Canada's brightest minds in emergency medicine from EMC Studios in Toronto. EM Cases is part of SREMI, Schwartz Reisman Emergency Medicine Institute, the nonprofit organization dedicated to improving EM care through research and education. The opinions expressed on this podcast are intended for information and education purposes only and should not be used to diagnose, treat, or prevent any medical condition, nor should they be used as a substitute for medical advice from a qualified practicing physician. Back when Aaron Sayel, one of our special guests on this podcast, started working in the ED about 30 years ago, the algorithm for patients with limb injuries was pretty simple. Do an x-ray where it hurts. If the x-ray shows a fracture or dislocation, make sure it's in good enough position and immobilize it. Follow up in the orthopedic clinic. And if the x-ray does not show a fracture, call it a soft tissue injury and prescribe RICE, the old restricted activity, ice, compression, and elevation, and suggest they follow up with their primary care physician, maybe some physiotherapy thrown in. But it just ain't that simple. And thanks in part to Dr. Ciel's masterful teaching on orthopedic injuries to the worldwide EM community over the last couple of decades, we've become much more sophisticated in our thinking around how to approach orthopedic injuries. In this podcast, we're not going to talk about the obvious trimalleolar fracture dislocation or the glaring Terry Thomas sign of scaphal lunate dislocation or the shattered proximal humerus. What we are going to talk about are the limitations of x-rays, how to become master x-ray readers, when ultrasound or CT may or may not help, and how to think about orthopedic injuries a bit differently than we have in the past. And to help us along with Dr. Cial, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce to you Dr. Yatin Chada, not only a radiologist with a special interest in MSK radiology at North York General Hospital, but a podcaster himself. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks for having us, Anton. Dr. Chatta, could you just tell us a little bit about your professional background beyond being an awesome radiologist at North York General and a very cool podcaster? That's very kind of you, Anton. So the radiology part, I'll keep really quick. I'm a MSK trained radiologist, did my fellowship in San Diego, and I've been in practice for six years. And outside of radiology, I do have a lot of interests. One that developed over the last several years was financial literacy. When I started practice, to be honest, I just felt so unprepared when it came to big topic uh, items like incorporating insurance policies, just setting myself and my family up for success. And so I created my podcast, Beyond MD, which is almost two years old now. And so very grateful for the support from the physician community on this. They've been incredibly supportive and hopefully adding some value for, for colleagues across the country. Right on. Congratulations on that. Hey, th- thank you, Anton. Thank you. Let's talk about orthopedic injuries and how to x-ray them. The majority of patients we see with orthopedic injuries don't have anything too serious, right? You know, some have obvious bad injuries, but it's that tiny sliver of patients, say two or three or four in a hundred that have subtle findings on history or physical or x-ray that have a really bad injury that's easy to miss. And we're not great at picking these up. I mean, if you look at the proportion of ED lawsuits that are orthopedic, it's about one third of all ED lawsuits in Canada that are MSK patients. And most of those are misdiagnosis. So the first question before we get into cases and all of that, like we normally do, is Dr. Cial, why is this? Why are we not great at picking up subtle orthopedic injuries and how can we get better? Like what's missing from the old school algorithm of do x-ray, immobilize a fracture, And that's it. Yeah, I I think what happens is we've become too dependent on an X-ray. And we we treat MSK patients differently than we treat patients who have chest pain or abdominal pain or fever or whatever it happens to be. For everything else, what do we do in medicine, in emergency medicine? We do a history, a physical, and then we think about the test. And orthopedically, for whatever reason, we just think about the test. And we have the auto ankle rules, we have the auto and knee rules. If you call an orthopedic surgeon and say you've got a patient with a fracture, they say, what's the MRN? Because they want to look at the x-ray. So we're so focused on the x-ray that we diminish the value of a history and a physical. And for obvious cases, the history and the physical and the test all tell you something's wrong. And orthopedically, for an obvious case, the x-ray will tell you. But for subtle cases, it's the history or the physical or the test that tells you what's wrong. If it's the test that doesn't tell you in this case, then we need to rely on a history and physical. And if we ignore it, we miss these subtle clues. So I think that's what it is. We're over-reliant on x-rays and we actually treat orthopedic patients differently than we treat others. And we need to just stop and just do a history and a physical before we do a test. 
Yeah, I like that analogy with chest pain patients. I mean, you know, sometimes what we do with orthopedic injuries is we see a normal x-ray and we're like, oh, okay, you're fine. But when we see a normal ECG, we certainly don't say, oh, you're fine <laughs> with chest pain because they could still have an MI. They could have a PE. They could have all kinds of life-threatening, horrible problems. So yeah, that's a really good analogy with the, with the chest pain. And I'm just kind of curious what your opinion is in terms of why do you think that in every other aspect of emergency medicine, we do a full history a full physical, we come up with a differential diagnosis, we have pretest probability, post-test probability, and we think about these things that we should be thinking about in MSK injuries, but for whatever reason, we just don't if someone comes in with a finger injury. Why is that? Well, I think a part of it is we just don't understand anatomy well enough, so we don't understand what the differential is and, and how to make those diagnoses. Part of it is when we consult our specialist, they want the x-ray, so we're totally focused on the x-ray. Part of it is we have rules that tell us oh, it's all about the x-ray. And another part is these are the patients that are in ambulatory. They're in fast track. And none of us want to be the slow doctor. So we take our time with headache and chest pain and abdominal pain. And we try to go quickly in fast track. In fact, it's called fast track. And therefore, we, we shortchange the history, shortchange the physical. You look at the x-ray first, you go, I, I know how this, how this novel ends. It ends as soft tissue injury. So then we don't even do a history or physical. We don't touch patients. And and I tell you this as one who missed all of these for 12 years before I started working in the fracture clinic. So I think all of these things play into it. And if we just treat our patients with MSK injuries the same as we treat our patients who have these other common complaints, I think we'll be better off. Totally agree. And Dr. Chatta, when it comes to interpreting MSK x-rays, what would you say in general are the most common pitfalls you see in the way ED docs interpret MSK x-rays? And how do you think we can improve on our interpretation skills? I mean, we'll, we'll get into the details of x-ray interpretation later in the podcast, but if you could just give us sort of a general sense just to plant the seed. For sure. I mean, to be honest, Anton, I think for the most part, you guys are, are really, really solid. Like we have a process where if I see something that maybe the interpreting emergency physician did not see... There's a discrepancy folder and I can put a discrepancy or I can text the physician. I often do that. But to be honest, I don't find myself doing that all that much. So given how busy you guys are, and I have some sense of that because we do call together and I think you guys are doing really, really well. Well, now, I think part the of the reason we're doing really, yeah. really well is uh, because of Dr. Siel, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Just yeah. so if anyone doesn't know out there, Dr. Ciel has made our Emerge group really good at orthopedic injuries because he's such a great educator and because he's really developed a great relationship with our orthopedic surgeons and our radiologists. I'm not putting another feather in your cap. You don't need another feather in your cap. But. <laughs> well, that's very kind. Thank you. But it's a great group for sure. It's a great culture. That's important to understand because our group, I would think, by Gestalt is probably a bit better than most eMERGE groups and really partly because of Dr. CL. And I think it's important to understand that where we work, orthopedic emergency works very, very well, which might not be so at other hospitals. So the question again was in terms of how we can better interpret x-rays in general. Absolutely. A few little things I will mention. Like recently we saw a 14-year-old kid who came in with pain in the midfoot and if you looked on the lateral view, all there was was just subtle, subtle soft tissue swelling. And if you feel your foot at the dorsal aspect, there's really no soft tissue there. It's like paper thin. So little things like that. If you see even the slightest amount of soft tissue swelling, just raise the index of suspicion. Although I couldn't see a fracture on the x-ray, kind of caught my eye. We ended up doing a CT and there was a fracture and basically at the base of the first metatarsal. Small things like that. I've seen a few cases, very limited, but where the quality of the x-ray, yeah, when, when it comes to the shoulder, we didn't have a perfect Y view or a perfect lateral view. And it led someone who was working on a very busy shift to think maybe the humeral head was subluxed. But when we interrogate the quality of that image, you know that it's not a perfect lateral view. And so when we had a chat, they went back to re-examine the patient and they decided, you know what, it's probably okay. So little things like that, always looking for the soft tissue swelling to guide you and dictate the level of suspicion look at the quality of the film, and then just certain patterns. We've had the benefit of having a couple uh, residents come in from emergency medicine to rotate with us. And one thing I'll just pass on here without going into too much detail, but the lumbar spine. When you're looking at the lower lumbar spine, for example, patients come into the back pain, they may have some kind of neurological symptoms. If you see even the slightest amount of anterolisthesis of L4 on L5, it's almost always due to a significant facet arthropathy at that level. And what that does is that predisposes to spinal stenosis, not for stenosis. 
But if you see antralisthesis of L5 on S1, that could be due to facet arthropathy or spondylolysis, pars defects, more often pars defects. And what that does is that predisposes to foraminal stenosis at L5-S1, not spinal stenosis. And that's a very, very kind of reliable, big picture way to look at lumbar spine x-rays and actually kind of surmise some very useful information from that. So once we get those patterns, you know, in the back of our mind and we look for that, I think it could be really helpful. So those are just a few things I'll mention. We have so much to unpack there, but just to review there, the quality of x-ray, very important, and to identify that there's poor quality of x-ray and don't hesitate to send the patient back to get a better quality x-ray. That soft tissue swelling should guide you, and we have the advantage of actually seeing the patient and seeing the soft tissue swelling, and then just understanding the different patterns. And that was a great example of the L-spine antral of this thesis predisposing to spinal stenosis. I want to throw in a case here. And then we're going to get into Dr. Ciel's differential diagnosis of MSK injuries in general. So here's a case. A 57-year-old woman with a history of lupus comes in with two days of right hip pain that radiates to the right knee to the point that she's having difficulty walking and going up and down stairs. She can't remember a history of trauma, but she has recently started a new Pilates exercise class. She takes low-dose prednisone and methotrexate for her lupus and her lupus has been pretty stable over the last couple of years. So, Dr. Ciel, could you let us know your initial thoughts on this 57-year-old woman with lupus and two days of right hip pain? Sure. Like, this is a, not the most common case, but might end up in ambulatory and fast track. And it, again, it just highlights the importance of not only knowing you know, what's the patient's story. She's had two days of atraumatic pain, which isn't overly concerning. 57-year-old isn't super old, spoken as a 56-year-old. So it's not really old. It's not a 75 or an 80-year-old who's more likely to have you know, more pronounced osteoporosis. But past medical history is also important. And the fact that she's on prednisone and on methotrexate is a big red flag. Absolutely. And these are immunosuppressant drugs. And it doesn't take long to ask the question. And you'll be surprised. Orthopedic surgeons always ask these questions when they do a history and a physical exam. Because it's, it's very brief what they need to know, but these are big red flags that if we skim over, we miss it. And it looks like just atraumatic hip pain. It doesn't look like a big deal. It's probably her Pilates class, and it probably is. But her pretest probability of having something more serious because of her prednisone, because of her methotrexate, has to go way up. So now when you examine her, if you're worried about infection, because she's immunosuppressed, you're not expecting a fever. You may not have a white count. Your concern for this being an infection is way higher just by the basis of the medications that she's on. And it just highlights the importance. Someone has an ankle injury, ankle pain, knee, whatever it happens to be, very quickly, but you need to be complete. You need to ask about their past medical history, previous injuries before, medications that they're on. All of this stuff is actually very important, and I think the case highlights that. Because a 57-year-old with two days of atraumatic hip pain after starting a Pilates class doesn't sound overly exciting. You add lupus, and all of a sudden now red flags are all over the place. Absolutely. Lupus patients scare me, by the way. I, I once saw a patient who presented with bilateral ear pain and ended up having a STEMI. Oh, they were God. a lupus patient. That they just, oh, God. They're just so atypical. <laughs> I was like, yeah. wow. Yeah. You might want to write that one up. That sounds a little unusual. Yeah, I know. It's like, are you sure you didn't have any neck pain or chest pain? Zero? Nothing? And I examined yeah. them and there was nothing in their ears. I was like, this is weird. But the lupus kind of tipped me off. But you're right, though. Like, you know, you, gallbladder disease with lupus makes you way more worried, right? If you can have a quads rupture, all kinds of things. Autoimmune disease is unbelievably a big risk factor for all kinds of badness in medicine. Absolutely. So, Dr. Seale, we did introduce your approach to the differential diagnosis of MSK injuries in our shoulder injuries podcast, I believe. But I think it's worth reminding our listeners of what it is. And I'd actually like to go through it in this podcast in some more detail. And that's your scared of mnemonic. So could you just go through for us the components of the scared of mnemonic? Kind of in the big picture, as you mentioned, an ECG, right? Patients with an MI, their first ECG is non-diagnostic 50% of the time. We all know this. You can have a normal ECG, but what should you be scared of? And we know what to worry about. So this is the genesis of this. If you have a normal plain film, ankle x-ray, you know, shoulder x-ray, when I say normal, there may, certainly may be some subtle abnormalities there, but there's no obvious fracture dislocation in front of us. What should you be scared of? And this is the mnemonic. So S is think of a septic joint. C is compartment syndrome. A is abuse. R, E, two letters, two things to think about. RE for referred pain. So the patient has knee pain, but it's referred from a more proximal source. 
RE, the report is false. As great as our radiologist colleagues are, there are misses. We have a radiology recall system in our fracture clinic for cases that radiologists miss. We all miss things, right? And just thinking that report is perfect is actually a failure that we can have. So if we have a history, we have a physical, we have eyes on the report, it's important, even if a report is there, try to look at plain films. The D is a dislocation or a subluxation that has spontaneously reduced. O is a particular type of a soft tissue injury, an operative soft tissue injury, where a delay in diagnosis or a delay in treatment causes the patient harm. And then F is a fracture that we just can't see on x-ray, an occult fracture. And if you just think through this, you don't have to do blood work on every patient. You don't have to do a CT scan on every patient. You just have to think of these as potential diagnoses. And if you think of them, your chance of missing them is way less. So I would like to dig deeper into this scared of mnemonic and discuss each aspect one at a time by going through some illustrative cases for some of them and really kind of drive home the importance of these and also some of the clinical aspects that can trip us up sometimes, especially things like septic joint. So let's get into it. The S of the scared mnemonic is for septic joint and our case of the middle-aged woman with lupus on immunosuppressants is a good potential illustrative case. So let's get back to that case. We're thinking about the possibility of a septic hip. Now, these are not easy to tap like a knee. So, you know, we depend a bit more on imaging for the initial workup. So before we get into blood tests and the physical and any of that stuff, the one question I had for Dr. Chada was, what would you look for on plain x-ray? What imaging tests would you do next if a plain x-ray is normal? Would you do ultrasound? Would you do CT? Would you do MR? Could you just give us an idea of the test characteristics of all these different imaging modalities for septic arthritis, in particular septic arthritis of the hip, which is a particularly tricky one? What do we need to know about imaging and the different imaging modalities for septic arthritis? Yeah, for sure. So the first test that would typically be done is an x-ray. And I, I like to start on the outside and move in. So the hip is really interesting. Forget about the bones for just a second. And you look just lateral to the hip joint you'll see three adjacent bands of soft tissue. That's rectus femoris, gluteus minimus, and gluteus medius. And then between them, you have low density on the x-ray. And those are normal intermuscular fat planes. So that's the path that the x-ray photon is taking. And so you want to make sure in a normal hip that those fat planes are preserved. So that's the first thing I look at, especially if there's any history to suggest infection. If I see any effacement of those fat planes, my index of suspicion is going up a little bit. So that's a very useful aspect to look for in the soft tissues. And then I go to the joint space. And if I have the luxury of having a comparison exam that's recent, if you see any degree of joint space narrowing that's happened over a relatively short time frame, index of suspicion goes up. And then finally at the bones, when you're looking at the joint, we're looking for erosions. So that's my x-ray approach to septic arthritis of the hip. All right, just to pause there, we all know that x-ray is not a good test for septic arthritis, but it's worth looking at for three things in particular, because if you do find any one of these three things, then it's another data point that would increase your index of suspicion for septic arthritis. So the three things to look for on x-ray for suspected septic arthritis are, number one, effacement of the fat planes, number two, narrowing of the joint space, and number three, erosions of the bone around the joint. The next thing that would happen, even if we don't have definitive radiographic findings, if there's clinical concern, you know, we have to get at the fluid in the hip. And that could be done with fluoroscopic or ultrasound guidance. It's very easy to get an ultrasound sometimes to problem solve to see, is there truly joint fluid? One thing I would caution people, though, is because the ultrasound is taken when the patient is supine, if there is fluid in the joint, you may not actually see any when we're imaging the anterior aspect of the joint because the fluid is lying dependently. So don't let, I guess, a seemingly negative ultrasound tell you that there's no joint effusion. Don't let that dictate what you need to do next, which is tap the joint. And that could be done with ultrasound or fluoroscopic guidance. And then really, it's, it's all about if further tests are needed, if the clinical picture is unclear, or if it's really a bad infection and orthopedic surgery is going to need to map out how extensive the soft tissue changes are, how far the marrow signal changes go, then it's really all about MRI. Like CT is much less useful in that context. Wow. Again, so much great stuff there. So we want to look at the effacement of the fat plane. So we'll have an image in the show notes about that because that one I didn't know about. From your eyes, it's probably easy to pick up, but for someone who's not experienced at this, is that something generally that's really, really subtle, or is that something that you think we'd kind of easily be able to pick up if we just knew about it? 
if you know to look for it, you'll be able to pick it up without a problem. For sure. Okay, great. So that's the effacement of the fat planes. There's the joint space narrowing. And then one of the key points there was even though ultrasound guided tap is a reasonable next step or fluoroscopic guided tap is a reasonable next step, that it's very important to know that a negative ultrasound for an effusion does not rule out septic arthritis. So it kind of begs the question of why order an ultrasound for a query septic hip in the first place? I mean, I guess if there's an obvious effusion there, then that helps because it'll trigger you to then go and do a tap. And then I didn't know that that CT actually is not very helpful, that MRI is really the go-to test. CT is easier to get for sure. And, and certainly you'd be picking up a lot of the big picture findings on CT. But when it comes to really looking at what's happening, the soft tissues, big abscess, CT, no problem but subtle changes in the muscles, true marrow edema. And there are techniques in CT where those aspects are are getting better to to figure out, but it's not the same as MR. Now, we're kind of going backwards here a little bit because, Dr. Shadi, you're a radiologist, so I wanted to get all that imaging stuff out of the way first. (laughs) Because I have a feeling that Dr. Sayal is probably sitting there saying, well, I'm not even sure that we need to go down all of that route because from an emergency perspective, we could just do a good history, a good physical, a few lab tests, and an x-ray, and then have our decision of what to do from there. So I might be wrong. Dr. Ciel, how do you approach a patient like this, 57-year-old lupus, you're querying whether this could be a septic arthritis, you have, say, a moderate pretest probability. What's your approach? Because I'm assuming that you're not jumping straight to an MR for, in your approach to septic arthritis. <laughs> yeah, no. You, so your assumption is correct as always, um, but it's a physical. Try to move the hip. If somebody has a septic joint, they really don't want to move it. It's a very uncomfortable joint to move around. So by all means, like do examine them. But if one is not used to examining a hip, you know, one doesn't know what it's supposed to be like. And this is another reason that we just need to examine patients more to understand normal so that we will recognize what abnormal is. But if all we do is we try to touch an abnormal joint, but we don't know what normal is, we don't get the clinical confidence that that's actually an abnormal assessment. So I think I think just highlighting that even these routine patients that you see, go examine them, go see what you expect. So you expect, you know, someone who's a little bit older, mid 50s, some of them do have arthritic hips and decreased range. In the 70s, you expect to be worse. In the 20s, you expect a nice supple hip. And you'll start to develop an understanding of what normal is like. And I think that's really an important thing for us to have in our back pocket. It'll make it more likely that we'll be able to recognize abnormalities if we have a much better sense of normal. Is it reasonable to say that in a patient with septic arthritis, they're very, very likely to have a restricted range of motion from pain? If they have a swollen hip, if they have an infected hip, their hip will take a certain position where it'll sit a little externally rotated, a little flex, because that's where it gives the greatest capsule volume. And then when you change that, it actually increases the pain in the area around it. So joints have their little common place where they like to sit, where it actually increases the volume around any joint, around an elbow, around a knee, whatever it happens to be. And moving from that, if they have significant swelling inside it, it causes pain, it distends a capsule, increases the pressure. All of these things cause discomfort. So if you have a nice, easy moving hip, it's never zero because very early, you may not have a big effusion. You may not have a ton of pain. It's all about your pretest probability. I just love the idea that from the foot of the bed, you look at this 57-year-old woman with lupus and you see that her hip is slightly externally rotated and that she tells you that any movement outside of that slight external rotation hurts. You've already almost, just from looking at the triage note, (laughs) you've already thinking that your pretest probability is pretty darn high. So that's a great sort of foot of the bed kind of diagnosis, that slightly externally rotated hip. One one other thing I just jump in there though, I'll tell you, Yes, you see that. And even though you don't think the x-ray is going to show you anything, take a plain film. Take a plain film in older patients. You never know if they've got like mets to hip or something else has gone on, you know, and we start chasing down infection in these people too early. And a plain film in these older patients, by all means, take a plain film first. Even if you don't expect it to show anything, if you're not going to be able to see the three planes, even if you expect the test to be normal, it's a great starting point in adults for sure. And then in terms of the rest of the workup, like laboratory investigations, what about white blood cell count, CRP, ESR? You had mentioned in immunocompromised patient that the white blood cell count is unlikely to be elevated. It's not going to help. What are the test characteristics of CRP, ESR, for example? How helpful, how not helpful? How do you incorporate yeah. that into your workup? I, I, I think it's worth doing them for sure. But again, like anything else, if you have a higher pretest probability, you're going to be less reliant on the test. So in somebody otherwise well, 
who has negative markers, not on methotrexate, not on prednisone, you're going to be more have more sense of reassurance if those markers are negative. But if you have somebody with a higher pretest probability, you're going to be less reliant on the test. So it's like anything else. Like you can have an ACS with a normal troponin and normal ECGs, and you can still have an acute coronation based on their story and their risk factors and whatnot. So it's the exact same principle. How worried are you about this patient? All right. It's one data point to add to your collection of data points that's going to bring you past a threshold where you're worried enough about it that you're going to do something about it. I got it. Okay. And what about, uh, there always comes up the question of when to give antibiotics in these patients. So we've got this 57-year-old, you're thinking maybe a septic hip, let's say their CRP and ESR are sky high, maybe they're even febrile. You've got a pretty high pretest probability. You want to start antibiotics because you're just thinking about how the hip is becoming this mush of nothingness and is going to require surgeries. And you just want, you know, everyone in emergency medicine has told you that anyone with septic anything needs antibiotics right away. And there might even be administrators telling you that you need to give antibiotics within a certain amount of time. So, you know, we have this mindset to give antibiotics fast. When should we give antibiotics, particularly in the case of a septic hip or septic arthritis in general? Right. So it's really ideal if we can wait until the joint's tapped off. So if you call ortho at three in the morning and say I've got a patient who I think has a septic hip, they're not coming in at three in the morning to operate on this person, to go look at it, to go, they'll wait till the morning. It, it, we, we, you're right. We get far more excited by it in emergency medicine than ortho generally does. If the patient clearly is systemically unwell, hypotensive shock, all of that stuff, then of course any systemic antibiotics, blood culture is going to be positive, all of that. But one of the biggest pitfalls, and you've nailed it right, with these sepsis guidelines, it's timed antibiotics. When we say think someone has a septic joint, we have to delay giving antibiotics until we've tapped off the fluid. If we tap off a knee or an ankle or an elbow and emerge, great, then you can give antibiotics after that if you like. But if we're waiting overnight for a hip ultrasound to be done under guidance, we should wait on antibiotics. We think the TAP is the gold standard test. In fact, it's not. It's probably only about 70 or 80% sensitive. Tissue culture is actually a better test. But if we give antibiotics before the TAP is done, that sensitivity in multiple studies goes down from about 75%. In one study, it went down to 25%. In another study, it went from 75% down to 40%. So not a relative 25% decrease, an absolute decrease of 50% especially in the age of MRSA and all these bacteria and and who knows what it is that's causing it, ID orthopedics wants to know the bug. It's really important. It's hard for us because we just, timed antibiotics are so important. This is the one case for a suspected septic joint. You need to hold off before you give antibiotics. If you think they have an open fracture, you cannot give antibiotics fast enough. So in these two ortho scenarios, don't withhold it for open fractures, but do hold back for septic joints. Beautiful. Those are some excellent pearls of clinical decision points for septic arthritis. We could do a whole other podcast just on septic arthritis, but we should move on in our scared mnemonic from the S for septic to C for compartment syndrome. So I actually had a case a few years back, and we just had one in our merge a couple of weeks ago, actually of a young athlete who was playing football who got kicked in the side of the leg eight days before he presented to the emergency department. He didn't seek medical attention at the time because the pain actually was pretty mild and he was able to ambulate. The reason he came to the ED on day eight was because the night before his ED visit, the pain on his lateral aspect of his leg got so much worse to the point that he had difficulty sleeping. And when I examined him, you know, even though his vitals were normal, except he had a slightly elevated heart rate, his neurovascular status was also normal. He was really, really tender on the lateral aspect of his calf. And I started to think about compartment syndrome, and I convinced myself that the lateral compartment was tense and full. I did an x-ray that was normal and an ultrasound that showed no DVT and nothing else, really. I called the orthopedic surgeon. He came and saw the patient, and he wasn't really too impressed because all the compartment syndromes that he had seen in the past were all really bad fractures. He finally did take the patient to the OR, And lo and behold, he had full-blown compartment syndrome. So Dr. Chato, let's do the similar thing that we did with septic arthritis. We'll kind of flip it on its head and talk about imaging first. So what role does imaging play in the diagnosis of compartment syndrome? And, and, And I suspect that it's kind of similar to septic arthritis. You know, like it's not like a slam dunk. The x-ray isn't very good. It's not going to tell us much. What is the role for imaging and compartment syndrome? I mean, in emergency medicine, if you have a very high pretest probability, we just skip the imaging altogether and just call the orthopedic surgeon. 
Can you give us the test characteristics of the various imaging for compartment syndrome and when you'd suggest that we do it, given that you are a radiologist, I guess you might have a slightly different perspective, but go ahead. For sure, for sure. So I will break it down into acute compartment syndrome and then chronic, and the chronic types are often exertional. But acute compartment syndrome, there isn't a dire need for imaging. And like some people say, acute compartment syndrome of the lower leg, there often is a fracture, but there's not always a fracture. So if we did an x-ray and uh, whether or not we see a fracture, that's not really going to sway things there. Ultrasound, I can comment on one case where recently we had a few months ago, a middle-aged woman present to emerge and she was on blood thinners, had a very tense leg. They ended up doing an ultrasound and it showed heterogeneous soft tissue and maybe a bit of a hematoma, blood. But the leg was so tense I think they probably would have gone to treating her operatively without that ultrasound. So in the acute setting, you don't really need any imaging from my perspective. It's really all clinical. Now, if there are repetitive cases of compartment syndrome, like this woman who came to emerge three weeks later, she presented again and the orthopedic surgeon called me and said, we need to get to the bottom of this. I went to the OR three weeks ago. There was some blood, some swelling, but it's happening again, and crazy enough, we imaged with an MR, and there was a, a sarcoma there that had been repetitively bleeding and expanding into the soft tissues. So acute isolated, probably no need for imaging. You don't have to have a fracture. And then, yeah, CTs are occasionally ordered. All CT is really going to show is expansion of the soft tissues and those very vital intermuscular fat planes being effaced. So if you see those findings, like volumetric expansion of the muscle, effacement of fat planes, that can point you down the direction of true compartment syndrome. Those are findings you can look for. But again, much better than CT. And I know it's harder to get, but if you have a chronic compartment syndrome, which is maybe exertional, MR is going to be much more insightful in this case. And then in, in the chronic cases, in the setting of chronic exertional, an x-ray can help because it can point to signs of overuse. Maybe you'll see a tibial or fibular stress fracture as well. Let's zero in on acute compartment syndrome, because that's what we're most interested in in emergency medicine. Dr. Cial, when should we consider acute compartment syndrome? Like, What are the key clinical clues? And once you have a high enough pretest probability, what, what do you actually do in the emergency department? Every time you see a patient with elbow injury, knee injury, forearm injury, whatever it happens to be, just put it on your list. And then very quickly, you can take it off if you're not worried about it. As exactly as was mentioned uh, earlier, you know, about 70% of cases of compartment syndrome involve a fracture, which means 30% do not. So it doesn't have to be with a fracture. Compartment syndrome tends to be a disease of young, fit males for a few reasons. Males, when you're younger, have more muscle bulk than when we age. As we age, we lose bulk. So therefore, there's less pressure in a compartment. Also, males compared to females... Males have less soft tissue compliance. Females have uh, more sort of pliable soft tissue. So if one were to see just even like ligamentous wise, you know, range of motion, it's greater in females. Uh, similarly, fascia itself has more pliability. And if you put extra volume into a compartment, if you had borders that would relax a little more, like in a female, it'll take more to raise a pressure. So for multiple reasons, you should think about this more in young males and older females. Every patient who comes to you, virtually every patient with extremity injury, has an alternate extremity that you can then palpate and feel. Again, you got to feel normal. So those are all kind of important things. Just get used to actually touching patients. One of the biggest issues in emergency medicine, we don't touch patients with MSK injuries. We don't know where it hurts. We don't know where to look on an x-ray. We don't feel compartments routinely. It is a skill. It does take time. You can do it without causing great discomfort to patients, but you need to touch patients. And compartments, you know, never write just neurovascular intact. You should always write compartments neurovascular intact and just get used to feeling normal. And then your hands actually will tell you something is abnormal before you even have a chance to process it. So this is just part of the art you have to get to. It takes, it takes a while. I like that cognitive forcing strategy of, you know, we're so used to assessing for the neurovascular status and then saying neurovascularly intact. And sure, someone with compartment syndrome can have a bit of numbness in their toe, but I like that. Just if you always document and force yourself to document compartments and neurovascularly intact, it just forces you to think about compartment syndrome in every one of these injuries. In medical school, we all learned about compartment pressure measurement on compartment syndrome. I've never seen compartment pressure measurement done in an emergency department before. How do we need to think about compartment pressure measurement? So a few things. The actual act of taking a compartment pressure is not easy. There are eight steps in doing it. You need to zero the machine. you got to do it. And they've done studies looking at how accurate we are, and we are not that accurate, number one, in doing it. 
Number two, what does the number even mean? Like, what is the actual number that defines compartment pressure? Well, we take generally accepted as 30 millimeters of mercury, but there are some surgeons that had tib fib fractures. They just routinely measured pressures. They got up to 62 millimeters of mercury measured in compartments, and none of them had signs of compartment syndrome. So what does the number mean? There's a new concept of delta P, which is the difference between the diastolic and the compartment pressure. If that's less than 30, that's a concern, but that's also somewhat arbitrary as a number. And then where do you actually put the needle? How many people know how many compartments there are in the lower leg? Well, there's four. Because if you have compartment syndrome, but you put the needle in the wrong compartment, you won't get the right number. And there are also studies been done where if you have a fracture, where is the pressure the highest? At the fracture, five or 10 centimeters proximal distal or 10 centimeters. So there's like anywhere four or five places where the number could be highest. So now you got to do four or five compartment measurements in four or five different places. Nobody does that. So the number actually is useless. I think a compartment pressure is a useless test. If you're worried enough, if you want to reach for something, reach for a phone and call an orthopedic surgeon and don't reach for a striker needle. That being said, the role, if someone's comatose, head injured, multi-system trauma, you think their compartments are tense, you don't have the clinical sign, by all means, then you might want to pull it out and to monitor these patients. There may be a role for it in that subset of patients, head injured, intubated, post-op, whatever. Another thing that we find in textbooks everywhere are the five P's of compartment syndrome. And we've talked about this before briefly on emergency medicine cases, but could you just remind our listeners, because it's just so important, Dr. Cial, what do we need to know about the five P's or rather, what do we not need to know about the five P's? Well, you need to know the five P's will be on your board exams. So you got to know it for that. But when you go from board exam to bedside, you should forget about the five P's. The five P's, there's six P's, there's seven P's, but it's really pain and pain out of proportion. If somebody has a tib-fib fracture, that's the most common place to actually have a compartment syndrome, sure, they'll have pain, but you have to know what to expect. Does it respond to medicine? Pain with passive stretch of the muscles that are involved. That's another thing because the pain comes from muscle ischemia. So pain, pain with passive stretch. And then the first neurologic finding is paresthesias because the sensory nerves are the more sensitive ones. The motor ones are, are late. The actual paralysis and pulselessness, see, that's what we do. We do a distal neurovascular assessment. Those are exceedingly late findings. If they're present, the limb is probably not salvageable. It's too late. And then what happens is we do a distal neurovascular assessment. We feel a pulse. They can move their toes. We go, oh, neurovascular intact. They don't have compartment syndrome. And that actually, the distal neurovascular assessment has nothing to do with assessing for compartment syndrome. We talk ourselves out of it. As we talked about, you need 30 millimeters of mercury as a pressure to define compartment syndrome. But if somebody has a blood pressure of normally, I don't know, 120 over 80, they have a lot of pain, it's now 150. What is the pressure you need to make their foot pulseless? 150 in a compartment. And they had compartment syndrome way back at 30. So pulselessness is exceedingly late. And if you've got paralysis, it means either the muscle is fried or the nerve is fried. And you would have had paresthesias, progressive paresthesias way before. So just seeing a toe that moves and feeling a distal pulse has nothing to do with compartment syndrome. So mention it on your board exams, but don't think about it at the bedside. Excellent. Now for our advertising segment brought to you by Metricade, the amazing scheduling system. Metricade can actually predict what the average physician to time assessment will be any given day by looking at the physician lineup. You know, some of my colleagues see two patients an hour, some see three or four or five patients an hour. If your group wants, Metricade will build the schedule based on this information as well as what shifts everyone prefers to work, creating a lineup that can handle the inflow of patients hour by hour. Best of all, the schedule still feels like self-scheduling rather than a performance algorithm. Those are some excellent pearls again on compartment syndrome. I'm loving this. We're on to the A of our scared mnemonic, and the A is for abuse. Now, we've done an entire podcast on pediatric physical abuse, and it's a very complicated, very in-depth topic. So we're not going to get into all of that here, but I just wanted to concentrate on some of the x-ray clues And I know based on that podcast that there are no slam dunk x-rays that rule in abuse and any fracture that we find on an x-ray can be abuse. But there's definitely some clues that could at least make us think about it. I assume that Dr. Cial might say, well, we should be thinking about abuse for every MSK injury. So that's one approach. But sometimes we forget and we look at the x-ray. Dr. Chato, what are some x-ray clues that should tip us off that abuse might be causing the injury? There are a few things that you can find on x-ray that make it a 
more higher specificity fracture. And then there are the kind of moderate to lower specificity fractures. So I'll focus on the high specificity fractures that we can see. So the first one is the metaphyseal corner fracture. Now, this is something that's really subtle. Honestly, for me to inspect this and diagnose this with a little bit more confidence, you have to have a good monitor in front of you. And that's why when we talk about child abuse, collaborating with our colleagues, interdisciplinary care is so important. So if there's ever a suspicion, just come and talk to us, right? Like we've got our high resolution monitors and it's not easy to pick these things up. So we're looking for small little avulsion fractures at the metaphyseal corners, and this is typically the long bone. So you're focusing mainly around the knee, proximal tibia, distal femur, and then you can also be looking proximal humerus. So, And of course, if you see multiple or if you see bilateral, then that raises your suspicion even more. So that's the first one, the metaphyseal corner fracture. The next high suspicion type of fracture is the posterior rib fracture, and the mechanism here is typically a squeezing injury of the chest. And so you're looking for fractures at the posterior aspect of the rib. Now, this is a very tough area to inspect when there's an an acute injury because you you can easily miss this. Because remember, when we're looking at a frontal chest x-ray, you often have a bit of overlap between the transverse process of the thoracic spine and the posterior aspect of the rib. Usually the fracture is just lateral to that transverse process, but it's very easy to miss. It becomes more apparent when you see some fracture healing. So those are the two, metaphyseal corner and posterior rib. Really zone in on those. And then any fracture in an unusual location. So we're looking here at the acromion, the sternum, and the spinous process. So those would be like the big ones, but focusing mainly metaphyseal corner and posterior rib as high specificity. And then there are lower specificity fractures, clavicles, other long bones, and then certain things in the skull. So if you see multiple, like an eggshell type pattern in the skull, or if you see an impacted fracture at the occiput, that's worrisome to me. Absolutely. Great. So I do want to refer our listeners to that episode we did in the past that goes into detail of all of these, but I think it's always a good reminder to know what those higher specificity injuries are, just in case we don't think about abuse earlier in our assessment. Those are all great points. I'll also just remind everyone listening, it's not just child abuse. There is espousal abuse. There's elder abuse that occurs. There are patterns that when you look at a fracture, I mean, we saw a a lady in her mid-60s who had an oblique fracture of the distal third of her ulna. And that's not from a fall. That's from a twist. That's from a rotation. So when she was asked about this, it was her son that took her arm and twisted it. So there are patterns like the appearance of the fracture line. If you see a spiral fracture, that's a rotational force. These also things can sometimes give you a little bit of a clue. And it tells a story about the force that caused it, how it occurred, the degree of soft tissue swelling. All of these things can sometimes play a role in it. So Just keep an open mind. The prognosis of missed abuse is poor. That's why it's important to pick it up because if we miss it, patients come back, whether it be child, spouse, elderly, with worse injuries. And that's really sort of our goal is to try to pick up these less common injuries. And unfortunately, the whole medical system is terrible at picking up abuse. Arun, I'm really glad you you mentioned that because sometimes we're not thinking about elder abuse as much. And so, like you mentioned, when somebody typically falls with trauma, distal radial fracture, ulnar styloid, but like you mentioned, ulnar shaft, spiral you have to think about it. All right, so we're moving on in our scared of mnemonic. We've covered S for septic, C for compartment syndrome, and A for abuse. Next up is the first RE, which is for referred pain. So Dr. CL, you had alluded to the knee-hip referred pain. Can you just give us some examples of orthopedic referred pain that seemed to be sort of like designed for us to miss. <laughs> I mean, referred pain is quite an amazing thing that like, <laughs> I've seen patients that they swear that it's their shoulder that's the problem and it ends up being their neck, or they swear that it's the knee that's the problem and it ends up being their hip. So what are some commonly missed ones that seem to be, quote, designed to fool us? Yeah, you've nailed it for sure. I think those are the common things that generally, if any pain, if it's distal, it could be coming from a more proximal source. We think of this as being radicular pain, like if someone had sciatica or something, but it's not always with referred pain. They don't actually know it's coming from more pro. They only know where it hurts. So this is why it's actually important to touch patients because the purpose of examining patients in orthopedics is not actually to cause them pain, but it's to find the cause of their pain. And majority of time, if somebody says my knee hurts, right? When you examine them, their knee does hurt. You'll find in that pathology where you touch it, it hurts. But if it doesn't, if you can't reproduce the pain, you need to consider a more proximal source. Classic is slip capital femoral epiphysis in children, but OA of the hip can present as knee pain. 
and only as knee pain. I missed a patient with a hip fracture. He presented 62-year-old guy, minor twist. I think we had this on one of your cases in the past, Anton. And he just had medial knee pain, came back to me in the fracture clinic a week later. I re-examined him. I don't know why you got knee pain. I asked him about hip. He said, no, it doesn't hurt. And I got him to straight leg raise, but I never actually internally, externally rotated him. And I had him come back and see a surgeon a week later, and now he has a fracture that shifted, and I totally missed it. So this happens for sure. It's why we touch patients. I've seen patients with Salter 1 fractures of the distal radius that have proximal forearm fractures or elbow fractures. It can be anywhere. A little caveat, a lot of these old patients have medial knee pain all the time because of OA. So for every older patient that says my knee hurts, you examine their hip because you don't know if that knee pain that you're touching and causing is new or old. So therefore, every older patient with knee pathology, definitely just internally actually rotate their hip. Great pearl. Just want to announce that planning for the online EM Cases Summit February 2nd to 4th is in full swing, and we have the speaker lineup finalized at emcasesummit.com. This is your chance to support EM Cases. You know, some of the other medical podcasts that have been around for years charge money to access them, but at EM Cases, we'd like to continue giving you the podcasts, the show notes, the quizzes, the videos, the email blasts, all the rest of the EM Cases learning system we've developed over the last decade for free. We're staunch Foam Ed supporters, and we'd like to keep it that way. So if you've been consuming Foam Ed, please consider supporting our ongoing Foam Ed efforts by grabbing a ticket to the EM Cases Summit. New this year are virtual simulation sessions in Sarah Fui's award-winning virtual recess room, which has limited access. So get your tickets soon, starting November 2nd at 10 a.m. That's when the tickets go on sale. In the virtual resuscitation room, there's teams of five people who work together in a simulated environment, resuscitating patients with expert debriefers, giving you feedback. So head over to emcasesummit.com for more details and grab your tickets starting November 2nd at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay, back to the scared of mnemonic. We're moving through the scared of mnemonic. We've talked about the first RE. Let's talk about the second RE, which is report is false. So Dr. CL... What is the miss rate for radiologists for an abnormality on an MSK plane film? And how should this sort of inform our decision making? I'd like to think that Dr. Yatton never misses anything on an X-ray. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, 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 as somebody who sees a lot of the X-rays in the fracture clinic, I'll tell you you're correct. I don't think I've ever said anything about Dr. Yatton. Well, I'm sure that we've all missed. We've but, all but, missed. We've all missed. Yes. You guys are very but, kind. But Yeah. And I'll tell you, our, I think our radiologists are exceptional at our hospital. But what does the literature say? The literature says that for plain films in the emergency department, the overall miss rate for radiology is about 5%. Now, what does that mean? 80% of patients, roughly, are nil acute. 80% of films are nil acute. And radiology tends to overcall 1% of the 80%. But of the other 4% are concentrated in the 20%. Now, part of it is our fault. Every single x-ray that goes down for chest x-ray says, you know, chest pain, chest pain, chest pain or shorter breath, shorter breath. We give them really no clinical context. In our green zone, if you go in green zone and you put up an x-ray, it auto-populates rule out fracture dislocation. We can't even tell them where it hurts. And many times we haven't touched them to know where it hurts. And if you send somebody with a foot x-ray and their problem is their fifth toe or the medial midfoot or their calcaneus, you're going to look differently. Try looking at a chest x-ray and looking for a pneumothorax if you don't think about pneumothorax. It's really hard. But when you know it's a 26-year-old with right-sided pleuritic pain, sure, you can get an ultrasound probe. But if you took a chest x-ray, you will look carefully for it because you're worried about it. And we don't help our radiology colleagues in any way. We just write rule-out fracture for everything, and then they have to go figure it out. And that's on us. So we could do a lot to increase that rate. But the literature will say the miss rate for radiology is about 20% of abnormalities. And Dr. Chatta, what are some of the common examples of significant orthopedic injuries that even radiologists tend to miss that we should be aware of so that we scrutinize x-rays even more and don't make that mistake of ruling out a fracture even when the x-ray looks normal to us or the radiologist? What, what are the common ones that you see? I'll talk about my experience first, and I did dig into the literature a little bit just to see how this matched up. So it's interesting because it does match up. So I'll start top to bottom. And so my experience is at the shoulder it's easy for anybody to miss a posterior shoulder dislocation because these patients have very limited mobility. You're really not going to be able to get an axillary view. And if that lateral view is off at all, 
it can be very, very misleading. And the mechanism for this is typically pretty violent internal rotation. So you're looking for a perfectly rounded humeral head. You're looking for that light bulb sign. And if you see it, you just have to have this diagnosis in the back of your mind. I have seen missed cases both by radiologists and by emergency physicians. It's just, it's tough. We, we don't see enough of it. So have that in the back of your mind. Pediatric elbow, so going further down, can be tricky. So we're always looking for uh, the supracondylar fracture, but then the one that can be a little bit trickier, and you know, these patients will typically be immobilized and followed up in fracture clinic, but it's the lateral condyle fracture. And this is often just this kind of linear flake-like avulsion off the lateral aspect of the distal humerus. Important to look for that. At the elbow, the coronoid process fracture, when there's a mechanism of posterior dislocation, it can honestly be just the smallest fragment off the tip of the coronoid process. That's one other one. And at the wrist, one area I try to scrutinize with extra care is the carpal metacarpal articulation because that again is an area. If your x-ray isn't done properly or if somehow if you only have two views, we're going to talk about views later. But if you see any overlap of bone there, especially at the ulnar aspect, those fourth and fifth carpal metacarpal joints, it can be easy to miss there. Scaphoid fractures, again, you need a perfect scaphoid view usually because if the wrist is in neutral position, just remember you can get overlap of the distal part of the scaphoid, that scaphoid tubercle, that can make things a little bit harder to interpret. Lower extremity now, hip fractures. The knee is really interesting because I may not see a fracture line, but on the lateral view, I'm looking for indentation of the femoral condyle. I don't like to measure too many things, but early on when you start to look for things you can measure, if you have indentation or impaction of more than two millimeters, accompanied by any amount of joint fluid, it doesn't need to be a big joint effusion. I have seen people miss this pivot shift mechanism of injury and it ends up being an ACL tear. At the ankle, there's been the odd case where on the frontal view and the mortise view, the lateral malleolar fracture isn't being seen well enough. And then it's only on the lateral view when you're looking through all the bones where you see that lateral malleolar fracture. So imperative to look at all our views really carefully. And then the foot, the list frank. Really, when I look at that second tarsal metatarsal joint, we're allowed zero, zero millimeters of offset. So that's another area where that tends to be missed. And then when I dug into this Dutch paper, it really showed that in kids, it was fractures at the elbow, wrist, and foot that were the most common. In adults, the foot and hand. And then in the elderly, it was the pelvis and hip. Those were the areas that were missed most often. It's interesting that that also kind of matches up with my experience of what tends to be missed. Well, this is like music to Dr. Seal's ears because uh, as you were saying that list, you could see Dr. Seal just smiling and just, I can <laughs> tell he's just going through it through his head that these are all things that he loves to teach about in, in his casted course and such. And it's really nice to hear that list because it matches very well with Dr. Seal, what we've talked about before on the podcast. And I just want to tell listeners that a lot of those things are kind of visual. And so we will have examples in the show notes of all of them. And I think it's worth kind of going through each of those carefully because we just kind of whip through them. But to really go through the images carefully and think about all of those. All right. I want to move on to the next item of our scared of mnemonic. So we've already talked about S for septic. We've talked about C for compartment syndrome. We've talked about A for abuse, RE for referred pain. And then the next RE was the report is false. The next letter is D. So D is for dislocation or subluxation. Now, these are sometimes very obvious, an obvious dislocation on an x-ray, but other times they're not so obvious, either because a subluxation is just a very small subluxation, and so you can't see it well on the x-ray, or you don't know to look for it on the x-ray. And the other one is the dislocation that's reduced in the field. And Dr. Seale, we talked about this before on knee dislocations how they are limb-threatening injuries that can reduce in the field and then just appear very swollen and painful when they arrive and emerge. Can you just remind our listeners of the typical clinical features of a spontaneously reduced knee dislocation? And then maybe we can talk about some of the subtle subluxations to look out for that are commonly missed. So a knee dislocation is a rare diagnosis just as aortic dissections are rare diagnosis. But every time you see a patient with chest pain, you think of aortic dissection, and no one says you're wrong to think that way, and you should feel the same way about knee dislocations. Uh, we need to understand what the story is for aortic dissection, and as you're asking, we need to understand the story of what a knee dislocation is like. And there are essentially a couple of subsets. One is a high-energy injury, motor vehicle collision, high-energy sports, that causes the knee dislocation. But there is a subset of patients who are morbidly obese, 
plus or minus elderly who have low velocity or what's referred to in the literature as ultra low velocity knee dislocations. You know, they can be 350, 400, 450 pounds, and they put a force on a knee just stepping off a curb that the knee wasn't intended for. And then the knee dislocates and could spontaneously reduce. And this goes back to the previous comment about just feeling normal all the time. One of the really important things when you examine somebody's extremity is to actually examine their normal side because there's a variation of normal of what normal's like. Females and younger people tend to have more general like range of motion and flexibility as males are tighter than females, older people are tighter than younger people. So you'd expect an older male's knee to be tighter than an older female's and all that stuff. So feel normal know what it's like. And the acute ligamentous exam that we're doing in the emergency department is not to diagnose ACL or MCL. It doesn't really matter. Those can be figured out down the road. We just want to know, is the knee stable or not? So you just take the normal knee, you just bend it about 20 degrees, you can put some bed sheets behind the knee, and you take their knee and just go anterior posterior, like a drawer, a lockman, anterior lockman, then push back and see how the normal side feels and just do a sort of medial lateral like valgus varus force and just get a sense of normal. You don't have to lift the patient's leg off the bed. Then go to the affected knee. And the same gentle way the patient knows what you're doing now, just slide anterior posterior and then just do a valgus varus. Very simple. And what your hands will say is, is this stable or unstable? And almost always, oh, it feels tight, 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 tight. And then one time your hand's going to go, what the hell is that? Oh man, that's loose. And then that's when you say, I think this patient dislocated their knee. So generally it's not that painful. Even if someone tore an ACL acutely, when you try to examine them, they're pretty tight because they got a lot of pain. But if they dislocated their knee, it's floppy. Defined as three out of four ligament instability. And if you ever say somebody had an LCL injury, that's an uncommon diagnosis. If you ever add that with either ACL or PCL, some people define that as a knee dislocation as well. Those are some great clinical pearls in terms of how we should examine a patient with a knee injury. And again, just forcing yourself to think about a knee dislocation, especially in patients with high BMI with a low force and then everyone with a high force injury. All right, Dr. Chatta, I had hinted that we were going to ask about subluxations and ones that are easy to miss. Just a few weeks ago, I had a teenager who fell off a bicycle and injured their ankle, and I couldn't see a fracture on x-ray, even on the lateral. But to me, the ankle mortise looked like it was a little bit off, like a little bit subluxed. And of course, we all know that even if the mortise is off by a couple of millimeters, that's a really big deal. They, they might need surgery. So could you just remind our listeners of how to assess for a subluxed ankle on the x-ray? And then maybe just some other examples of which subluxations are easy to miss on x-ray and how we should look out for them. Absolutely. So I I do really like the ankle joint. So every MSK radiologist typically has a favorite bone and a favorite joint. So when I'm doing MR, the ankle joint (laughs) is kind of my thing. Yeah, it's really nerdy, but the ankle joint, the anatomy is as such. So the lateral malleolus is situated behind the medial malleolus. So to basically get those in the same AP plane, one has to internally rotate the ankle 15 degrees. That view, the mortise view with that internal rotation is what allows us to assess the space between the medial malleolus and talus and the lateral malleolus and talus. And so we follow that space around the mortise and we want to make sure that it is symmetric all the way around. I don't like to measure things when you're earlier on, you can measure, but usually you want to make sure that space is less than four millimeters for those people who just want to get used to looking at it. And it has to be symmetric all the way around. Now, the other part of the ankle x-ray, and you're interrogating this mainly on that mortise view with that internal rotation, is the distal tibiofibular syndesmosis. Again, I don't really like to measure, but you want to make sure that that's less than six millimeters when you're starting out and looking at things. And basically, these views are an indirect way for us to assess the stability of the ankle. And I like to think of any joint as an articulation, and it's surrounded by a fortress of stabilizers. So the ankle joint has the joint capsule, And then the more external stabilizers are the ligaments. So medially, we have the deltoid ligament complex. And then at the syndesmosis, we have four syndesmotic ligaments. And then laterally, we have several ligaments. We tend to focus on three. But those are the stabilizers and part of the fortress that keeps that ankle joint stable. And basically inspecting the mortise and that distal tibiofibular syndesmosis on x-ray, that's a way for us to indirectly glean information about those ligamentous stabilizers. 
Also on the lateral film, just be very careful sometimes with fracture dislocations to make sure they're back in joint. If that tibio tailor joint, like the anterior aspect of the tibia doesn't line up with the talus, that can actually cause a lot of problems with the tailor dome. So just really scrutinize on your on your trimals, bimals that are surgical cases that the, on the lateral film, the ankle joint's reduced. That's a great point, Arun. You were mentioning, uh, Anton, just a few other areas. I can comment on a few other areas that I think are really important to look at. So when you're looking at pediatric elbow, you'll see different views sometimes, and it doesn't matter what view is taken. So you have the radial shaft, and then the radial neck is typically at a little bit of an angle, but when you draw a line from that radial neck, that line has to run through the capitellum on every single view, and that is so, so important. It's something I look for on every pediatric elbow x-ray. And then the wrist, the carpal metacarpal joints, Often what will point you to an injury there or a subluxation or dislocation is when you're looking on the frontal bone, look at the bases of the fourth and fifth metacarpals. If those are overlapping with the ulnar aspect of the distal carpal row, you know, those bones are not meant to overlap. There's an articulation there. Always look at that really carefully to look for any injury. That's one I didn't know about. So the overlap between the proximal fourth and fifth metacarpals and the carpal bones? Yeah, so you don't want to see the base of the fourth and fifth metacarpals basically overlapping with the hamate. You don't want to see that because there's a normal articulation there. That's the fourth and fifth carpal metacarpal joints. But if those osteous structures are overlapping, it means that there is malalignment. And that's something that can easily be missed. Great one. A couple others to add to that. It's missed a lot in the emergency department, and I missed it for sure for years. I never wrote this diagnosis. Is the distal radio ulnar joint. The distal ulna gets popped out. It's subluxed. Patients can't supinate, but we don't move them. We don't touch them. And we miss this, and they have problems with forearm rotation down the road. Dr. Chada mentioned earlier about posterior subluxations to the shoulder. They're usually subluxed and not actually dislocated, which makes them really subtle to see. And that radio capital line is a big one because if you see it in a kid, sometimes they just pop out their radial head by themselves. It's not a pulled elbow. It's actually a radial head dislocation when it's off. But if you see it in an adult, that also can be with a ulnar fracture in the midshaft, a Montegia fracture. So it's in, in all comers, adults and kids, that radio capital line on every view. Solid pearls, yeah, and thanks. Yeah, I don't know, you as well, you as well, that's awesome. All right, we're in the home stretch of our scared of mnemonic, we're on the O, and O is for operative soft tissue injury, and you've alluded to this, Dr. CL, already. Most soft tissue injuries can be safely treated non-surgically. Something like an ACL may eventually be treated surgically, but from an emergency perspective, they don't need surgery now. There are some that actually do need timely surgery that we really should diagnose in the emergency department. There's quadriceps tendon tears, there's patella tendon tears, there's distal bicep rupture. We've covered those in detail before on EM cases. I think it was episode 58 and 121 for people that are interested in going deep into quadriceps tendon, patella tendon, and distal bicep rupture. But Dr. Seale, what are some other potentially surgical or can't miss soft tissue injuries we should be on the lookout for? And what what are some of their clinical features? Just trying to understand which injuries, if there is delay in diagnosis, the patients get harmed from. So there are a lot of soft tissue injuries that are surgical, but if it's a meniscal injury, they can wait three months. But if the knee doesn't fully extend, that's called a lock knee, and they shouldn't wait more than six weeks to get surgery. Otherwise, they'll have a problem. So there are a bunch of these operative soft tissue injuries that we have to be careful about. So you totally alluded to the, the main ones. If we started, let's say, at the shoulder, there aren't very many that need an operation acutely. But if you ever saw a patient in their 40s or 50s, maybe a really solid 60-year-old with a complete rotator cuff tear, Those should be in the hands of a surgeon sooner because they're more likely to be surgical. 20 and 30-year-olds rarely get rotator cuff tears, and older patients, 70, 80-year-olds, they're going to be treated with physio. So surgery is not really a role for them. So that sort of middle-aged adult with an acute rotator cuff tear, if you suspect it, they should be seen in a more timely fashion because they want to get surgery quicker. I just want to repeat for the listeners there that a middle-aged person, which I can squarely say I am, if I get acute rotator cuff tear... That should be seen by orthopedics within a week or so, as opposed to, oh, here's a prescription for physiotherapy, follow up their family doctor. So that's a really good one. In the lower extremity, there isn't really much in the hip that would get looked after that way. The knee you mentioned, quads rupture, patellar tendon rupture. And Achilles, even though it's not treated surgically necessarily, and I'll tell you, our group offers a surgeon, offers a patient surgery, and about half of them take it. The evidence could be debated at some other point about whether they need operation or not. But if the diagnosis is missed, 
and the patient's put into a foam walker, let's say, and it isn't in the specific Aquinas in plantar flexion, then it's like a misdiagnosis. And then the option for non-operative treatment becomes far less possible. So it's important to pick up Achilles for sure. The old Thompson test, don't forget that one. Excellent. That's a great list to remind us about soft tissue injuries that need more urgent referral to an orthopedic surgeon. We come finally to our last letter in our scared of mnemonic for F, which is fracture that is radiographically occult. Now we've talked about commonly missed occult fractures on EM cases before. I want to talk a little bit more about the theory of this, and we've alluded to this already But I want to ask, how do you use Bayesian thinking to decide on what to do with patients where clinically you're worried about something and you do not see a fracture on the x-ray? Like, how do you decide how much the normal x-ray will shift your pretest probability of an occult fracture? It's an excellent point that we don't just take a normal x-ray and say it's not fractured. It really depends on how worried we are, but it's like any test. If you go back to when we first learned about tests, yeah, we keep forgetting this principle that, or many of us forget the principle, that the purpose of the test is actually not to make a diagnosis. It's just to affect our pretest probability. So you need to have a pretest probability to interpret any of these tests. So if, classic example, 70-year-old plays tennis, falls, and she's got pain in her distal radius immediately, comes to your emergency department, she's tender in her distal radius, her pretest probability for a fracture has got to be 90%. Older patient, weaker bone, immediate pain, trauma, tender, sore, swollen, localized pain. That's what a fracture looks like. If you had a, I don't know, a 20 year old guy who just hit his, you know, the radial side of his wrist on a desk, it's like, ah, oh, man, that thing hurts. He comes to your emerge six days later. Okay, so the guy's got a sore wrist. You'll take an x ray, but your pretest probability is probably 10%. And then if you take all patients, let's say, when we talk about sort of a likelihood ratio, if someone had a fracture in the emergency department, a plain film, 95% of the time, the x-ray will show you overall for all comers. But 5% of the time, patients with a fracture, the x-ray won't show you. So if you have a 90% pretest probability and you go through this Bayesian theorem, there's a nomogram you put it through, on the other side of it, after the normal test, their probability of a fracture is like 33% still. But if your pretest probability was 10% and they have a negative x-ray, after the test, it's less than 1%. So this is how it helps. They both have a negative x-ray. It's just how worried you are. And what it means is, what is their history? What was the force applied to it? What is their quality of bone? What is their age? Old people more likely to fracture. Young adults have good quality bone. What is their exam like? And then what you do is you trust your clinical judgment. And how does this play into it? Well, if I'm worried someone has an occult distal radius fracture as an adult, that's a benign injury. I can immobilize and follow up. Occult scaphoid, I can immobilize and follow up. Occult C-spine, occult hip fracture, we should probably arrange advanced imaging because the misdiagnosis is more significant. So this is why it's important. It's hard to immobilize a hip patient and say, come back in a week for another x-ray. Before I sign off, we have a new free EM Cases offering on the horizon. It's called the EM Cases Journal Club. This is the most concise, evidence-based critical appraisal of the most recent practice-changing and interesting EM articles served to you once a month by the critical appraisal EBM guru, Dr. Rohit Mohindra. We'll have them posted as a blog on the EM Cases website. And to get them in your inbox, all you need to do is hit the subscribe button on the top right corner of the EM Cases homepage and choose which free email blast you want. We now have three, Journal Club, Q&A Pro of the Week, and Just for Nuggets. That's our scared of mnemonic. It took us a while to get through that, but wow, there were literally dozens of amazing pearls in there. Thank you so much, gentlemen. I cannot wait for part two when we'll talk about the specifics of how to order and interpret x-rays properly, talk a little bit more about the indications for ultrasound and CT, and to talk a bit about the future of orthopedic assessment in the emergency department. So thank you very much, gentlemen. I'll see you in part two. Thank you, Anton. Hey, thanks for having us, Anton. (laughs) 